Good morning, and thank you, Michelle and Thermo Fisher Scientific, for the opportunity uh, and invitation to speak to you today regarding how the West Virginia State Police Forensic Laboratory is using uh, sodium hydroxide extraction and Quantifiler Trio as a Y screen to improve workflow with regard to sexual assault evidence collection kits. We'll discuss how our small laboratory uh, ended up moving from a body fluid identification to a Y screening process and keeping in mind the SWIGDAM report released this past June on Y screening. But first, a little bit about our state and our situation here. West Virginia has a population of a little bit under 2 million, which our laboratory serves. The number of reported sexual assaults in our state is around 1,100 a year. And we have one standardized sexual assault evidence collection kit, which we use statewide. We also distribute that kit to several laboratories in Ohio and in Maryland uh, for use on West Virginia victims, kits that will be coming back to us. And our kit is a pretty standard kit. It contains two internal vaginal swabs, two external vaginal swabs, anal, oral, additional swab for oral contact. There's a pubic hair uh, combing or pubic area swab envelope in there. Uh, we also have various packaging items for clothing and we also include a toxicology kit with blood and urine uh, collection materials for uh, drug facilitated sexual assaults. But we have 72 collection facilities in our state, including hospitals, child advocacy centers, and healthcare clinics. One does not have to be a SANE trained nurse in West Virginia to collect a kit. We have SANE trained nurses as well as non SANE trained individuals collecting kits. So, based on that, training and experience of those individuals, we do see a wide variety of both quality and quantity of items collected in our kits. To help with that situation, we use our in-house tracking software application not only to track the location of kits, but to also record the quality of the kit collection. We will make comments if an individual says that there was oral contact with her neck, for example, but there were no neck swabs collected, we will provide a quarterly report back to that hospital saying that there's a need for improvement there. And we will also provide that information to our SANE trainers so that it can be used in, uh, in their trainings. Our laboratory itself is made up of two sections with regard to DNA. We have a biology and processing section with six full-time forensic scientists, one of which is in training and recently hired. And our biology DNA section has 11 full-time scientists and three technicians, a total of four who are in training at this point. Uh, and you'll recall I just said that we have about 1,100 sexual assaults reported in West Virginia a year. Our sexual assault kits are distributed by the processing section of the laboratory. We uh, custom order them through Searchy and distribute about 600 kits on average a year over the past eight years while we've been recording this information. And we have received back about a third of those kits year after year repeatedly, even though we've requested repeatedly that all kits which are collected be submitted to our laboratory. This was especially true following our Danny Grants and Saki initiative projects where um, we are required to prevent kits from being unsubmitted to our laboratory. So we can see from this chart that uh, we have a problem getting the number of kits that we send out coming back to our laboratory. To be fair, some of them are non-reported sexual assaults, which go to another off-site facility at Marshall University for storage. And we know that some kits are used in training, but we estimate that around uh, 200 kits a year are collected and not submitted to our laboratory. Um, our laboratory supports the mandated submission of a sexual assault kit. If it's collected, it should be submitted here. This is also supported by our state's sexual assault forensic examination. Uh, committee. So we are in support of a mandatory submission and began several years ago preparing for such a thing to occur. Uh, we increased our storage capacity at our lab. Uh, we can now house upwards of 3,000 kits if we had to in a newly built evidence storage room. And we began the hiring process of two new employees, one in the processing section and another in DNA to handle the expected increase in caseload that this would bring about. Uh, and more, most importantly, we began validating and looking into the Y screen process 
to change our workflow with regard to moving from body fluid identif identification to a Y screen. All of that really kicked off in 2019 when the West Virginia State Legislature passed Senate Bill 72, which was the Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights. That bill said, among other things, that a victim has the right to have a sexual assault kit tested and preserved by the investigating law enforcement agency. That bill also said that the victim has the right to know the results of those tests, provided that it does not interfere with the investigation. That is the responsibility of the investigating law enforcement officer in the case. That was in 2019. This year in 2020, in March, uh, the West Virginia legislature passed House Bill 4476, which we call a direct deposit bill, uh, dealing with the direct deposit of sexual assault kits. 4476 says that upon collection, sexual assault forensic examination kit shall be submitted for testing by the health care provider to the West Virginia State Police Forensic Laboratory within 30 days of collection or as soon thereafter as practical. Um, that bill became effective in May, on May of 2000, I'm sorry, May the 18th of 2020. Since then, I've been able to look at the increase in the number of kits that we're receiving every month, and I'm able to project that by the end of this year, we will see approximately 400 kits submitted to our laboratory. I expect the increase this year will be about 150 cases. Next year, I expect we'll see a full 200 more cases than our past average. Um, it might be interesting to note here that we are receiving fewer requests this year for sexual assault kits. I don't know if that's the case nationwide, but we have speculated a little bit that this is perhaps due to some fear um, of going to the hospital in these times. So you can see here, we did have an increase, an expected increase in the number of kits that we are having received at our laboratory. I will say that uh, House Bill 4476 had some teeth with it, um, calling it a misdemeanor crime if anyone willfully neglects to follow uh, this directive. So prior to February of 19, our laboratory was performing body fluid identification on all items submitted in a sexual assault case. Clothing items, swab items in a kit, bedding, whatever was submitted. We tried to limit the items, but for the most part, uh, our case submission policy would allow for multiple items to be submitted, and we would perform that leukomalachite green presumptive test, acid phosphatase presumptive test, uh, an ABA card P30 lateral flow immunoassay for um, prostate specific antigen, followed by a Christmas tree stain, and your occasional RSID saliva test. If you're performing those tests, you know that they take time and sample. Uh, time and samples both are consumed in this testing. Notice that top slide in the center, the amount of material that we would collect, uh, take from the swabs for a acid phosphatase test. We'll come back to that in a minute. And here are the uh, amounts of sample that we would take for a P30, and then maybe another cutting for an RSID if it was requested. Our laboratory at the conclusion of that testing would maintain our multiple samples retained for DNA testing. Multiple extractions, quantitations, and amplifications would then be performed in the DNA section on those samples. Uh, just as a note, our DNA section is using um, Hygen Easy One Advance XL for extraction of those samples. Um, we did and still do prepare a report of our initial findings in the processing section. Uh, I would also say that in cases that were negative, if we had a negative presumptive test or negative confirmatory test, we would keep samples uh, knowing that the DNA testing is more sensitive than our presumptive testing. So if there was an allegation of a contact, we would keep that sample even with a negative presumptive test. So after February of 19, we began doing a sodium hydroxide extraction and quantifiler trio amplification on swab samples in male suspect and female victim sexual assaults. This is what we validated. Um, let me thank Thermo Fisher and Jared for the work they did on that. We benefited greatly from it. But we are performing the Y screen on two swabs per area tested. 
So I mentioned that our internal and external vaginal swabs, we typically request two swabs for every area, every body area um, that could be collected, and we test those together. We would take a tenth to an eighth of each swab and combine that into one Y screen test for that area swabbed. Most swabs in a case are tested. We're typically seeing anywhere from four to 12 sets in a usual case, and we are not performing serology unless we're specifically requested to do so. We are a two uh, report, two extract workflow laboratory, so we are still writing a report on our results. Now that we're doing the Y screen, we find that we are only retaining one to two items retained for DNA testing, and that's based on the result and the scenario that we're faced with. If there is oral contact to the neck or breast, we will keep those swabs if they're positive for male DNA, as well as uh, preferably an internal vaginal swab uh, if that's the best sample. The STR, YSTR decision is made in the DNA section based on the quantitation values from the full swab extraction. So we're not making a determination in processing about the direction the testing will go. That's made after the uh, full extraction over in the DNA section. A little bit about a sodium hydroxide extraction and what we're calling a dirty extraction. There is no purification of the samples that we're testing. So we are only doing this on swabs that are in sexual assault kits, no clothing items. We didn't validate that. Um, but this test is performed in a LICEP column, uh, which you see there in the lower center. This is just a column with a separation filter and membrane, which breaks with centrifugation, allowing the lysate to flow into an extraction tube. We will put the two one-tenth to one-eighth swab cuttings in 100 microliters of one normal sodium hydroxide and place that onto a thermoshaker uh, set at 80 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes at 700 RPMs. It's a very quick extraction. Uh, that DNA is stable in the alkaline solution like that and it is then centrifuged for two minutes, separating the substrate from the uh, extract, which is then neutralized with four microliters of glacial acetic acid. That is then diluted uh, one to fifth dilution in TE minus four and is ready to amplify with the uh, quantifier trio. So we are using quantifier trio on an AB7500 real-time PCR instrument, 96 well plate format. And it will take me about an hour and a half from setup to results. And from setup to results, I mean, I've got my extracted DNA from the uh, sodium hydroxide extraction. We're going to set up the amplification and place it on the real-time instrument. And if within about an hour and a half, we have results and are ready to collect samples for DNA testing. Typically, I'm assigning uh, five to seven sexual assault kits per analyst per week. When we're doing these runs and we are able to uh, set up, do all the paperwork necessary and uh, add the samples to our limbs, take our bench notes, cut the samples, get them in tubes, perform that extraction, and we will have a result at the end of about a two-day period. Uh, so if we start on Monday morning, I typically have results in five to seven cases per analyst um, and, and I'm ready to go. We will typically batch two to three analysts per plate and uh, batch our work in that fashion. The real-time PCR itself is, uh, the quantifier has four targets really. It has a small autosomal target uh, of 80 base pairs. These are multi-copy conserved regions of DNA. Um, the large autosomal target is 214 base pairs in size. The haploid Y target is 75 base pairs in length. There's also a internal PCR control, which is a 130 base pair synthetic strand of DNA that's amplified. Uh, we rely on this amplification here to be a guide to us as to whether or not we're seeing any inhibition in the sample. So we're routinely checking the IPC to make sure we're not seeing any inhibition in our samples. Uh, we have seen some, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. But besides the quant values of those three top targets, small, large, and Y targets, we are also able to determine a degradation index uh, due to the size of those small and large autosomal targets, as well as a male to female ratio in the case. And this can give us an idea as to whether or not that sample is going to end up going uh, towards a YSTR, 
analysis or perhaps uh, differential extraction and globophile. Here I have an example of a multi-component plot. This is uh, fluorescence uh, relative to cycle number. And you should be able to see here that the internal PCR control, which is this red curve, uh, kind of took off at around 27 cycles across the cycle threshold there. And we have an IPC value there for 27.2 in this case, um, which is what we typically see in an uninhibited sample. Uh, this particular sample was part of our validation and is a 10% male blood mixed with female blood. So 10%, uh, 10 microliters of male blood and 190 microliters of female blood. And that was diluted 100 fold. And you can see from the result that the small autosomal target, which is the primary target of the assay, quanted at um, 0.02 nanograms per microliter. And the Y value is approximately a tenth of that, which was what we would expect in a tenfold dilution, um, a tenfold mixture like that. So this is what a typical run looks like. The next three slides are real case examples where we have taken approximately seven samples from a sexual assault kit and performed the screen on. And I'll go over how we are using this information to uh, select the samples that are going forward for DNA testing and what we would have done in the past with a Y screen, uh, with a body fluid identification. So this first case is a negative male DNA case where we receive seven samples, we screen seven samples, the external vaginal swab, an anal swab, a set of anal swabs. The uh, nurse examiner in this case collected four oral swabs, so we divided those into groups of two and screened oral swabs one and two and oral swabs three and four. There was a pubic hair swab, a neck swab, and an unusual sample of inside the ear swab. So in looking at the Y values for this, you can see that there was no male DNA detected in any of these samples. And that's exactly how we would have reported this case in our processing laboratory report. We would say that no male DNA was detected in these samples. With the exception of the inside the ear sample, which we would have reported in this case as inconclusive. Uh, take a look at the IPC value there, the internal PCR control uh, across the cycle threshold at 31 cycles. This is a little bit high and can be an indication of an inhibited sample. In this particular case, we would have called that inconclusive and sent the sample over for confirmation with a, a DNA extraction and purification before the TRIO run. Had we been doing body fluid identification on this case, we would know based on the scenario, what body parts were indicated as being affected in this case or touched. And we would have kept probably the external vaginal swab sample, an anal, an oral, and perhaps the next sample to begin testing with. The next case, again, with seven samples is what we would call a low level male DNA case. Again, we have an internal vaginal sample, which was two swabs, a sample just labeled vaginal, which we don't know if that was the same uh, area collected as the internal vaginal, it's just labeled vaginal. Uh, the cervix swabs, a mons pubis swabs, two swabs labeled around left nipple, uh, two swabs labeled around right nipple ring, and two swabs from a belly button ring. In this case, we had relatively low amounts of DNA in all of these samples, lowest of them being the cervical swab, which is usually one of the better swabs. But in this cervix sample, and based on our validation, we would call this one a trace amount of DNA because in our laboratory, we know that anything below 0 0.0004 nanograms per microliter or 0.4 picograms per microliter, um, we would not expect routinely to have repeatable results uh, on a full swab extract of this cervical swab sample. Right now, we're still calling them positive. We're just saying it's a trace amount, and we're looking into it a little bit further if we can say that an insufficient amount of male DNA was detected to continue on with testing. Right now, though, this is a trace sample. But you can see from these results that I can now make an educated decision about what is the best sample to send over for DNA testing. I just don't have a weak AP um, and maybe a negative confirmatory test with body fluid ID. I can look at this and say, okay, the internal vaginal swab sample has the highest quant of male DNA uh, as far as an internal sample goes. 
but I'm going to select uh, the around the right nipple ring swab as an external body sample that has the best chance of giving a full DNA profile. So in this case, I've uh, very neatly narrowed it down to the two best samples that we can send over for testing and have our best um, expectation for results. Thirdly, we have a case with another seven samples that gave us pretty nice results. So I've got vaginal vault swabs one and two, three and four, another cervical swab, an external vaginal swab, a pubic area swab, and then anal and oral swabs. Um, of these, you can see the vaginal vault swabs three and four gave the highest Y value of 0.2 nanograms per microliter, uh, better than the other two swabs of um, vaginal vault one and two. The cervical swab is positive, um, but not quite as much as the vaginal vault swabs. And the external vaginal swab is very positive. Now, if this case involves someone who had had prior consensual intercourse, we might then make a decision to test both the internal and external vaginal swab samples. But because in our state, the sexual assault is defined by penetration um, of the vagina, then we are going to usually go with an internal sample if we believe that that sample will give us results. Pubic area and anal swab is also positive, and then there's a nice clean oral sample with no male DNA detected. One of the things that I've been able to do is to take a look at the last 2,000 samples that we've done the Y screen on and make a comparison of the body cavity and the amount of times that we obtain a result. Uh, I've done this for internal and external swabs. And you can see here that the vaginal swabs that we get about 47% of the time are positive. Compared to that to cervical, where about 61% of all the cervical swabs that we've um, tested have been above 0 0.0005 nanograms per microliter. So above 0.5 picograms per microliter, we're seeing that 61% of our cervical samples. Compare that to the oral, where only 7% of the time we're getting a result that's that, that's that positive. Um, with regard to external body swabs, breasts have been pretty good at 22%. Neck, over 56% of our samples are positive um, when they're collected, which is a, a really great sample. So I can take this information back to our uh, SANE trainers, back to our hospitals, and say, be sure to collect that neck swab. If she says there was oral contact with the neck, um, get that neck swab, take that cervical swab. Those are showing to be our, our best samples. Um, some of the other things that I'd like to do in the future with this chart would be to add to that the post-assault interval and say, how often are these samples positive when there was a shower? How often are these samples positive uh, from 24 to 48 hours after the assault, uh, 48 to 76, and so forth? Can we say more about when we lose the ability to obtain a DNA result from a sample based on um, post-assault interval. Can I make any conclusions about whether a sane trained nurse is doing a better job with quality of collection than a non-sane trained examiner? That's something else that we can do to try to support the use of SANEs in our state uh, as those who are collecting sexual assault evidence kits. And lastly, is a slide where I tried to make a little bit of a comparison between the cost of performing a body fluid identification, which we have on the left, and a Y-screen examination, which I have on the right. Um, relatively speaking, there's not a great difference in the cost here. The cost savings and the time savings that we're seeing is coming um, post-processing, where we're able to make a better informed decision about what is the best sample to keep for DNA testing. I do think there is some cost savings. Uh, I think we're seeing some time savings because I'm not having to wait for um, an hour extraction to do a P30, and then if that's negative, selecting another sample to do, or I'm not spending an hour at a microscope looking for sperm in a case where they don't exist. We're going right to the Y screen, learning if that male DNA is present, and then sending the best samples over for DNA testing. So I, I look forward to some conversation about what we're doing here and how we're doing it. How are you doing it with regard to the Swig Dam report? And with that, I will give this to Jarrett and he can continue the conversation. Um, and I do look forward to some conversation. And thank you for your time.